Okay, so again, the title of this is Yeshua and the Millennium Sukkot. And I was praying and the Father just really put it on my heart for us to look at what we have to look forward to. Because in the world we're living in now, there is just so much evil, so much chaos going on. It's easy for our eyes to get uh, off of our future, off of our hope and our glory and what we have to look forward to ruling and reigning with Messiah. I'm going to open up. Now, the majority of Messianic uh, believers and teachers believe that Yeshua was born during the season, the season of Sukkot. And I'm going to share some uh, information that shows how uh, that conclusion has you know, come. I'm sharing from uh, Joseph Good. It's an expert from his book, Rosh Hashanah and the Messianic Kingdom to Come. Joseph Good is considered an expert on teaching on the temple. I've been to one of his seminars and I have several of his, uh, the books that he usually does these seminars with Rico Cortez. So he's you know, very well versed regarding the temple and uh, the days we're living in as well. So this is again from his book, an easy, doc an, an easy to document, but not well-known fact is the date of the birth of Yeshua. This is done by establishing several things. The date that Gabriel, the angel, tells Zechariah, the son-to-be, father of Yochanan, about his son's birth. The birth date of Yochanan is established by going forward nine months, the term of pregnancy. The approximate date of Miriam's conception and the date of Herod's death. So again, through tradition and the, uh, again, Constantine is the one who again changed the, uh, started the celebration of Christmas to align with all the pagan celebrations in, in Rome. Uh, he was, if you study his history, you know, he was, quote, converted to Christianity. His mother was very much into paganism, pagan worship. He was part of the Council of Nicaea where they banned any Jewish worship they banned shabbat they banned the feasts they pretty much uh told anybody who practices they be they would be put to death and yet that tradition of celebrating yeshua's birth on december 25th has gone on for two, you know um, a little you know almost 2000 years and again as we as we look at you know i mean we look at it one way well at least they're recognizing that yeshua is the king of the earth but as you study how the world celebrates Christmas, Yeshua has nothing to do with it. So again, and this is good information, again, to share with your friends and family in a loving way, why we don't celebrate, you know, quote, Christmas or Yeshua's birth on December 25th. The date that Gabriel, the angel, told Zechariah that he and his wife were going to have Yochanan is established from the following. Luke 1 5 states that Zechariah is a priest of the course of Abijah. King David, according to 1 Chronicles 24, had divided the priestly families into 24 groups. Each group was called a course and named after the head of that particular family. Each course served for one week in the first half of the year and for another week the second half of the year. This was in addition to the weeks of Hag HaMatzah, Shavuot, and Sukkot, when all the courses were required to be present, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Therefore, the first course served the first week of the year, Aviv, which would have been the Passover time, the second course, the second week, then all the courses, the third, because it was Hag HaMatzah, and so on. First Chronicles 24, 10 lists the course of Abijah as the eighth course. This course would serve the 10th week of the first half of the year, having allowed two weeks for Hag Hamatzah and Shavuot. It is at this time that Zechariah receives the prophecy of Yochanan's birth. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name Yochanan. Due to the laws of separation, 
two additional weeks have to be counted. Allowing for this and going forward a normal pregnancy, the time of Yochanan's birth, if this is the first half of the year, would be approximately Pesach when it is expected that Elijah would appear. Okay, we know just to get straight, John was not a reincarnation of Elijah, but he came in the same spirit and power and boldness of Elijah, the same uh, sanctification of being set apart for the purpose of proclaiming the Messiah. Six months following Elizabeth's conception, the angel Gabriel is sent to Miriam, the cousin of Elizabeth. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Miriam, which it's, that is uh, Mary's Jewish name is Miriam. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Miriam, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Yeshua. He will be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Luke 1, 26 to 33. Starting at Hanukkah, which begins on Kislev 25, which usually falls in the month of December, and continues for eight days, and counting through the nine months of Miriam's pregnancy, brings one to the approximate time of Sukkot. The question arises, how can it be known that Zechariah was given the prophecy about Yochanan in the first half of the year rather than the last? The key is found in the life and death of King Herod. Herod, a man hated by the Jewish people, figures prominently into the birth of Yeshua. In Matthew, or Matthew 2, he is visited by wise men from the east. Now, when Yeshua was born in Bethlehem, of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. From the information in this passage, it can be understood that the wise men are Jewish. Why? Because they knew the scriptures. They knew that the Messiah was promised. The pagan world was not looking for Messiah. It was the Jewish world, Israel. While the verse does not tell how many wise men there are, it does give reference to where they were from. In the Bible, the land of the east is always the land of Babylon, Genesis 29.1 and Judges 6.3. During the first century CE, the largest Jewish population was in Babylon. Why? Because there was many left over. They were sent there for 70 years due to their apostasy. And but when the time was time for them to return, only a small percentage returned to Israel and the majority uh, stayed in Babylon. So they were one of the countries that had, you know, the the most amount of Jews uh, to, to, you know, for a long time. During the first century CE, the largest Jewish population was in Babylon. These people were the descendants of the captivity of Nebuchadnezzar. Even though Ezra, Nehemiah, and others had returned, most of the people had remained behind. The fact that the wise men are looking for the Jewish Messiah, who was only expected by the Jewish people, should be noted. A prophecy relating to the Messiah that only the Jewish people were aware of is found in the book of Numbers 24, 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. Because of the prophecy, a star was related to the coming of the Messiah. An example of this is seen when 100 years after the time of Yeshua, Rabbi Akiva mistakenly proclaimed a military leader to be the Messiah. His he was titled Bar Koba, which meant son of the star which we know by history, he was not the Messiah because Messiah already came. 
the rabbis or the sages were known as the hakamim, which means the wise men. The sage Daniel was referred to by the same title. A related word, mag, is also used for wise men. The Greek magi is taken from the Babylonian word mag, which has a number of meanings. It is true that the word does mean astrologer. However, this is not its only usage. The same word is used for scientist, counselor, or scholar. It is an obvious conclusion then that the Jewish sages are wise men from Babylon, knowing the prophecy of Numbers 24, 17, relating it correctly to the Messiah and having seen his star travel to Jerusalem to pay homage. Herod was possibly one of the coldest and most bloodthirsty men who ever lived. He killed his sons, his favorite wife, and thousands of innocent people. His fear of losing his throne drove him to insanity. Augustus Caesar, having noted that Herod observed Jewish law and therefore would not eat pork, once made the statement that it was better to be a pig in the house of Herod than to be one of his sons. Why? Because the pig was safer than his own family. It is no surprise that Herod sought the child's life, nor that all of Jerusalem would be troubled as Herod received this news. Matthew 2, 3, when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Traditional teaching is that the wise men appeared about a year to 18 months after the birth of Yeshua. This has been based upon Herod's killing of the male children under two years, according to the date that the wise men had given him for the appearance of the star. Matthew 2, 7 to 8 and verse 16, then Herod, when he had privately called, the wise men inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. It was a custom in ancient Israel to count the years of one's age from the date of conception. Therefore, Herod actually killed the children one year old and under, according to the way age is calculated today. In fact, the wise men arrived in Jerusalem either just prior to or at the time of Yeshua. So, you know, isn't that interesting that here, even in ancient Israel, they considered a child's age from the date of conception. They con the minute that child was conceived, he was, again, a person um, that he was, you know, counted as already as existing, you know, uh, contrary to what the abortionists say today. It is important to know that up to this time, no one in Jerusalem, including the temple priest, had heard that Yeshua had been born. Knowing the nature of Herod and his practice of having spies throughout the countryside, it is impossible that he would not have heard of his birth. Luke's account of the birth relates the experience of the shepherds of Bethlehem, and after seeing the newborn Yeshua broadcast what they have seen and heard that the entire region... Luke 2.17, and when they had seen it, they had made, no, made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. Realizing that Bethlehem is within five miles of Jerusalem makes it improbable that Herod or the temple priest would be ignorant of his birth. Further proof is seen in that 40 days after the birth of Yeshua, Miriam carries Yeshua to the temple for her purification <clears throat> and his dedication. It is here that two well-known individuals within the temple compound and make no prophecy concerning the child. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, <clears throat> And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, was upon him. 
And it was revealed unto him by the Ruach HaKodesh that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Yeshua to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou prepared before the face of all people, a light to the a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at these things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Miriam his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. And she was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks unto the Lord and spoke to him all that they looked that looked for the redemption of Jerusalem. Having realized that it was impossible for the wise men to arrive after these events, it can be assumed that they must have spoken to Herod about the time of his birth. Traveling on to Bethlehem, they found the child and his parents in a house. Matthew 2.11 Whereas in the Luke account, the shepherds found him in a stable, Luke 2, 7 and 16. There is no discrepancy between these two accounts, for likely the new mother and child were moved from stable following the birth. The fact that he was born in a stable is a clue to the time of his birth. For in Hebrew, a stable is called a sukkah, Genesis 33, 17. Sukkot, the name of the festival, is the plural form of this word. It is even significant that they had to seek cover in the sukkah due to no room in the inn, Luke 2, 7. It was only during the three pilgrim festivals, Pesach, Hag, Hamatzah, and Shavuot, that Bethlehem would overflow with people. The thousands of pilgrims coming to Jerusalem for the festivals would spill over to the surrounding towns. In ancient times, support, uh, reporting for a census would be done over several month period due to the difficulties of travel as well as the economics of an agricultural society. It is highly probable that so many people would be in Bethlehem for Caesar's sentence all at one time. As stated above, Joseph and Miriam bringing the child into Jerusalem 40 days after Yeshua's birth, this indicated that Herod died within the same 40 days. The chronology of these 40 days is imperative in correctly finding his birth date. The probable scenario is this. Joseph and Miriam come to Jerusalem for the festival of Sukkot, September or October, planning to stay in the nearby Bethlehem in order to register for the census. Unable to find a room at the inn, they are given shelter in a stable, which just happens to be a sukkah. During the night, the wise men arrive in Jerusalem and speak to Herod. Meanwhile, Miriam gives birth, the heavenly host appear to the shepherds and proclaiming that Messiah has been born. They go to pay homage to him in the stable while the wise men were making their way to Bethlehem. The shepherds leave to noise it abroad and Miriam is moved to a house. The wise men arrive and during the night are warned by God concerning Herod. Joseph and Miriam take the child and flee to Egypt and remain there until they are told by God that Herod is dead. And returning to Judea, they dedicate Yeshua according to the law, receiving the prophecies of Anna and Simeon after they return aside into Galilee where they live. So again, uh, according to the Torah, the, the, the child, the, the male boy is circumcised on the eighth day. So Yeshua would have already been circumcised and the dedication would be presenting him again to in the temple uh, before the Lord. It is apparent that as long as Herod was alive, they would not appear at the temple. Therefore, if the approximate date of Herod's death would be could be determined, it would establish the season of Yeshua's birth. 
The Jewish historian Josephus, who lived during the first century CE, documents in detail Herod's death. Jos Josephus relates that Herod became very ill immediately following an act of impiety against the priesthood, at which an eclipse of the moon occurred. This eclipse, the only one mentioned by Josephus, happened March 13th in the year of the Julian period 4710, and the fourth year before the Common Era. Herod's illness lasted several months and is documented in great detail as being painful and distressful. Many times curses were sought, I'm sorry, cures were sought and brought about temporary relief. However, nothing prevented imminent death. According to Josephus' calculations, Herod's death occurred about September in the fourth year before the Common Era. Therefore, with the knowledge that Herod had died in the autumn, the same time of the year of Sukkot, that his death was within 40 days of the birth of Yeshua, it is established that Yeshua was born at this time of year. Again, that's according in... Uh, I've heard a lot of other uh, commentaries and, you know, again, from different scholars that uh, they all believe that, again, this was the time because why Yeshua, you know, he, he, he fulfills all the feasts, all the prophecies. So God had a specific timing. It wasn't happen chance that he was, you know, born during this time. So we see that um, Yeshua was born on the first day of Sukkot, circumcised on the last, which had been the eighth day, who will return on a future Yom Turah, Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, and then be here with us on a future Sukkot to tabernacle among his people. At this point, he will fulfill all of Yahweh's seven festivals or appointed times. So again, the fall feast, especially now the time of Sukkot, is looking for the time that we are going to be dwelling with him for all eternity and again there's different you know uh again thoughts about yeshua's birth i know rabbi khan you know feels that it was during passover um but his is the minority of opinion the majority of opinion is that yeshua was born during the feast of sukkot and again i agree with that you know the bible doesn't specifically give us a date but there's hints, you know, as Joseph Good pointed out, too, that this was the time of the year of his birth. This is from the Temple Institute regarding the Feast of Sukkot. The special joy that marks the celebration of the festival of Sukkot in the Holy Temple renders Sukkot unique among the three festivals. One of the many reasons for the holiday's enthusiastic happiness is that Sukkot is the festival of the harvest. The Jewish farmer, having gathered the fruits of his labor into his home and enjoying the abundance of God's blessing, comes to the temple with his heart filled with exuberance and thanksgiving for all that God has given him. Again, looking forward to the time that uh, we are going to reap the harvest that we have sown. Uh, we are going to re be rejoicing before the God of Israel who has redeemed us with thanksgiving for all that he has given us. A man of Israel comes to the holy temple to express his utmost joy. He takes in hand the four species, the fresh and green, and arrives at the courtyard of the house of God to fill the Torah commandment. On the first day of Sukkot, they were to take the etrog and lulav, which we had at our first, our first day of Sukkot fellowship, and rejoice before Hashem for seven days. The mitzvot of the four species is fulfilled in its most perfect form, with all of Israel gathered together as one in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem. Now the temple courtyard was huge. I have like an animated uh, program that actually shows uh, pictures of the uh, the Solomon's temple and the and the re, the temple of what they call Herod's temple, but um, that was you know re, rebuilt. Um, <clears throat> so again. Uh, the mitzvot of the four species is fulfilled in its most perfect form with all Israel gathered together as one in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem with the lulavim or the lulav and etrog in hand and marching around the altar singing the Hallel prayer and calling out Ana Hashem Hoshia Na. The rejoicing before God was manifest as well in the singing and music performed 
by the Levites in the Holy Temple throughout the festival. Though the Levites sang and played every day of the year, on Sukkot it was especially felt, as the Mishnah states, on 12 days each year the flute was played before the altar, including the eight days of Sukkot. The streets of Jerusalem took on a holiday flavor during Sukkot, and many sukkahs standing proud on the roofs and yards and on the streets for the, use, for the use of both residents and visitors from across the land. The streets were also filled with people carrying their four species wherever they went. The uniqueness of the Sukkot festival is manifest as well in the many offerings that were brought to the temple during the holiday. Dozens of animals were offered as communal offerings, including 70 bulls corresponding to the 70 nations of the world. In addition, from all over the country came Jews with their many holiday offerings as specified in the Torah, and many also brought first fruits of the season as well. Again, uh, a great movie to watch just to get the idea of, of what Sukkot is like in Israel. Ushbatim, I was watching it last, we were watching it last night. You know, wouldn't it be great to live in a country where everybody could put their sukkah up? I mean, because Israel, again, was is, you know, follows the feasts and it's, you know, it's got set apart land. I mean, all of Israel is filled with sukkahs. They're like everywhere on the street, on balconies, you know, wherever they could put them. Several specially joyous events are held on Sukkot. These include the joy of the water drawing, Simcha Beit HaShoveh and the willow branch beating in the courtyard and the water libation and the hachal ceremony every seven years with the participation of all Israel, men, women, and children. Uh, and it, they, you know, they're saying, and I think Minister Scott brought this up, that with the willow, when they were beating the willows, I mean, it just sounded like a, a rushing wind, you know, uh, going through the courtyard. This was the time that Yeshua chose to announce, uh, again, uh, who he is. John 7, 37 to 39. On the last, the greatest day of the feast, and this is talking about, again, the, 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 last, the last day of Sukkot, Yeshua stood up and cried out loudly, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Again, during this water pouring ceremony, they would take water from the pool of Siloam. They would bring it up in the highest place of the temple and again, pour the, the water out. I believe being some uh, symbolic of God's pouring out his blessings. And Yeshua is using this to point to him himself that whoever believes in him out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the Ruach whom those who trusted at him were going to receive for the Ruach was not yet given since Yeshua was not yet glorified. Then we see him stating this to the Samaritan woman, John 4, 9 to 14. Then the Samaritan woman tells him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me a Samaritan woman for a drink? For Jewish people don't deal with Samaritans. Now, again, the Samaritans were, uh, they were actually a mix, part from the northern tribes and, uh, that were intermarried to uh, non-Israelites. Non Yeshua replied to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman tells him, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Then from where do you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us his well. He drank out of it himself with his sons and his cattle. Yeshua replied to her, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water I will give him shall never be thirsty. The water that I give him will become a fountain of water within him, springing up to eternal life. Revelation 22, 17 to 21. The Ruach and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes freely take the water of life. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, 
God shall take away his share in the tree of life and the holy city, which are written in the book. Then one giving testimony to the, these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Shua. That's when we say, Bo Yeshua, Bo. We're saying, come, Yeshua, come. May the price, may the grace of the Lord Yeshua be with us all. Again, this is going to be a little longer study, so I hope you all stick with me because this is very important. Again, we're looking at uh, the coming kingdom of Yeshua and all that we have to look forward to. And what the Ruach put in my heart is like, we need to meditate on these things. We need to think on these things. So we're not carried away by the things that are happening in the world. And we keep our eyes on the one who is our deliverer, the one who is our redeemer and who we are going to live with for all eternity. Again, on the last day of the festival, Hoshana Rabbah, literally on the last day, the great festival. Again, this is David Stern, who just actually just went to be with the Lord. I think he passed away right after Yom Kippur and just before Sukkot. He's the one who did the translation for the complete Jewish Bible and the uh, Jewish New Testament commentary. So he's really has, has done a lot to really open the eyes of people to the, again, the, the Jewishness of the New Testament. Throughout the seven days of the festival, a special Kohen had carried water in a gold pitcher from the pool of Shaloak to be poured into a basin at the foot of the altar by the Kohen Hagadol. It symbolized prayer for rain, which begins the next day on Shemini Etzeret. And it also pointed toward the outpouring of the Ruach HaKodesh and the people of Israel. The rabbis associated the custom with Isaiah 12, 3. With joy, you, you draw water from the wells of salvation. In a suggestive reflection of how the holiday was used to, used to be celebrated, today's Moroccan Jews pour water on each other at Sukkot. On the seventh day, the water pouring was accompanied by Kohanim blowing gold trumpets. <clears throat> Again, not shofars at this time, they were gold trumpets. Levim, uh, the Levim or Levites singing sacred songs and ordinary people waving their lulavs and chanting Hallel, Psalm 113 to 118, which includes in its closing verse, Adonai, please save us. Hebrew, Hoshea or Hoshana. Adonai, please prosper us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Adonai. We have blessed you out of the house of Adonai. God is Adonai and he has given us light. Psalm 118, 25 to 27. The words, please save us, led to the days being called Hoshana Rabbah, the great Hoshana. This prayer had messianic overtones as is seen from its use when Yeshua made his triumphal entry into Rushalayim a few days before his execution. We see this in Matthew 21, 9 and Mark 11, 9 and 10. It was also a prayer for salvation from sin, for Hoshana Rabbah was understood to be the absolutely final chance to have one's sins for the year forgiven. On Rosh Hashanah, or Yom Teruah, one asked to be inscribed in the Book of Life, Revelation 20, 12, and on Yom Kippur, one hopes to have the inscription sealed. Yet in Jewish tradition, there remained opportunity for forgiveness up to Rosh Hashanah, uh, Hoshana Robah. In addition, a connection between the possession of the Ruach HaKodesh and ecstasy or religious joy is found in the ceremony of the water drawing. Simchat Beit Hasho Ive, Feast of Water Drawing and the Festival of Sukkot. The Mishnah said that he who had never seen this ceremony, which was accompanied by dancing, singing, and music, have never seen true joy. Yet this was also considered a ceremony in which the participants, as it were, drew inspiration from the Holy Spirit itself, which can only be possessed by those whose hearts are full of religious joy. Jerusalem Talmud. From this passage, we also learned that Yeshua and his Talmudim, like other Jews, observed at least portions of the oral Torah and did not utterly reject it as traditions of men, since the water drawing ceremony is specific, not in the Tanakh, but in the Mishnah. So again, there, were, there was uh, some things of the oral Torah that Yeshua recognized, um, but not necessarily 100% of it. But again, this was because in the oral Torah explains how to do certain things, how to 
uh, do um, Shabbat, how to do, you know, the, the kosher killing of an animal, et cetera. It was, in the, it was in the midst of this water pouring, trumpet blasting, palm waving, psalm chanting, and the static joy on the part of the people seeking forgiveness and in the presence of all 24 divisions of the priesthood, which we talked about before. So again, <laughs> Hebrew scripture is always sung when they speak, uh, if they're um, reading the Torah portion, there's like a, a, a chant that goes with that. The prayers like you for, hear us every week are sung. So they would have been singing again, the Psalms and chanting away. I mean, it, it must have been just so awesome to hear <clears throat> that Yeshua cried out in the temple courts, if anyone is thirsty, let him keep coming to me and drinking. Whoever trusts in me, as the Tanakh says, rivers of living water will flow from his innermost being. I want to look at some of these <coughs> passages in Isaiah. I'm going to pull up um, the scriptures. I just want to get in my notes so I can read uh, where the passages are. Okay. All right. I'm not flipping back and forth. Read these verses in Isaiah. So let me just pull up Bible verses here. <clears throat> hey, Isaiah 44, verse 3. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. Then Isaiah 55, verse 1. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the water. You who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy, <clears throat> come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. In Isaiah 58, verse 11. Then Adonai will guide you continually, satisfy your soul and draw it and strengthen your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Okay, and again, we, we quoted the scripture from the woman at the well and the ultimate fulfillment, Revelation 22, 17. In effect, Yeshua was declaring, I am the answer to your prayers. His dramatic cry, supported by the full uh, <clears throat> panoply of temple ritual, was not misunderstood, as John 7, 40 to 43, makes abundantly clear. His subsequent proclamation, I am the light of the world, also based on the passage of Psalm 118, quoted above, provoked an even more agitated reaction. So again, it's like here you can, you know, see people that were expecting the Messiah, but when the Messiah appeared, again, we're talking about the religious, the, the common people, the people that had hearts for God, um, they recognized, you know, they recognized that this had to be the Messiah. But again, many rejected him because they weren't the Messiah that he was expecting. Zechariah 14, 1. Uh, now I'm going to read this all the way to 18 because this is uh, actually the whole chapter because this is an important uh, chapter prophetically. Behold, the day of Adonai is coming when you pl your plunder will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to wage war. Now this is the end time war. You know, the scripture says all Jerusalem shall be saved and they will realize that Yeshua is the Messiah because he is going to miraculously deliver them. The city shall be captured, the houses ransacked, and the women ravished. Half the city will be exiled, but the remainder of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then Adonai will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which lies to the east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a huge valley. Half the mountain will move forward toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now, with Bible prophecy, too, I mean, in the same prophecy section, you can have uh, God referring to current events, but then future events as well. We know that Yeshua 
ascended into heaven on the Mount of Olives. And the angel said, you know, that he is going to return to the Mount of Olives when he comes back. Then you will uh, flee through my mountain valley because the mountain valley will reach you Azal. Yes, you will flee like you fled from the earthquake in the days of King Uzziah of Judah. Then Adonai, my God, will come and all the Kedoshim with them. So Kedoshim are the saints. So again, who are the saints? Those of us who believe in Yeshua the Messiah. We are his bride. We are a part, again, of the body of Messiah. Then it says, Adonai, my God, referring to Yeshua. And that day there will be no light, cold or frost. It will be a day, a day known only to Adonai, neither day or night, even the evening time, there will be light. <clears throat> Again, I believe this is referring to Yeshua's return when Yeshua says that no man knows the time of his return, only the Father. <clears throat> moreover, in that verse 8, moreover, in that day, living waters will flow from Jerusalem, half toward the eastern sea and half toward the western sea both in the summer and in the winter. Adonai will then begin looking to the future millennial kingdom. Adonai will then be king over all the earth. And that day, Adonai will be Echad and his name Echad, Echad meaning one. The whole land from Giba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, will become like the Arabah. Jerusalem will be raised up and occupy her place from the Benjamin gate to the place of the first gate to the corner gate and from the tower of Hanel to the king's wine presses. People will dwell in her and no longer will there be a ban of destruction. Jerusalem will live in security. Again, looking towards the millennial kingdom. Now this is the plague which Adonai will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are standing on their feet, and their eyes will rot in their sockets, and their tongues will rot in the mouths, which I believe this is referring to the tribulation when these countries are attacking Jerusalem. And some prophetic teachers say it almost sounds like an atomic type bomb, but God is the one who Yeshua is going to destroy them with the words of his mouth. It'll happen in that day that a great panic from Adonai will be among them. Each person will seize the hand of his neighbor and they will attack each other. Again, speaking of Israel's enemies. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the surrounding peoples will be gathered together. An abundance of gold, silver, and apparel. A similar plague will strike the horse, the mule, the camel, and the donkey, and all the animals in that camp. Then all the survivors from all the nations that attack Jerusalem, again, this is referring to the very end of time, this is during the millennial kingdom, will go up from year to year to worship the king who, Yeshua, it says the king, Adonai Zavaot, and to celebrate Sukkot. Notice how many times Sukkot's mentioned here. Furthermore, if any of the nations on earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king, Adonai Zavaot, they will have no rain. If the Egyptians do not go up and celebrate, they will have no rain. Instead, there will be the plague that Adonai will afflict on the nations that do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. So it's, it's again, obvious that during the millennium, they are going to have to be obedient to the law of Yahweh or suffer the consequences. And one of the laws is to go up to Jerusalem during Sukkot. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. And that day, holy to Adonai will be inscribed on the bells of the horses and the pots in the house of Adonai will be like the sacred uh, bowls in front of the altar. And in fact, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah will be holy to Adonai Zevaot so that everyone who comes to sacrifice will take them and cook in them. In that day, there will be no longer a Canaanite in the house of Adonai Zevaot. So here, again, a lot of scholars have, you know, reflected on this because it, it's apparently that there are going to be sacrifices in the millennial kingdom uh, with, with the third temple. Um, and again, nobody's is speculating, well, what type of sacrifices there are going to be. Um, but again, that's what the word says, that there will be, again, a time of, of, you know, sacrifices, again, we don't, there's all different kinds of sacrifices in the Torah. 
um, but we know that Yeshua is the only sacrifice for sin. Isaiah 66, beginning with verse 15, for behold, Adonai will come in fire and his chariots like the whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with, with flames of fire. For by fire and the sword, Adonai will execute judgment on all flesh and those slain by Adonai will be many. Those who consecrate and purify themselves to enter the groves following after one in the midst who eats sw swine flesh, vermin and mice will come to an end altogether. It is the declaration of Adonai. So here you see the Leviticus uh, food laws are still in place. And this is again referring to entering groves. Uh, this is referring to pagan worship. For I know their works and their thoughts. I will come about that I will gather all the nations and tongues and they will come and see my glory. Then I will set up a sign among them and I will send survivors from them to the nations, to Tarshish, Pool, Lud, who pull the bow, to Tubal and Javan, to distant islands that have not heard my fame or seen my glory. Then they will declare my glory among the nations. So here we see there are going to be survivors, again, from the tribulation period that are going to be living on earth. They are not going to be automatically born again just because they survived the tribulation. They are going to have to come. I mean, there are that there are that will come to faith in Messiah, but those on the earth are still going to have to make a declaration of faith in Messiah during that time who have not been born again. We're going to look at that a little more going forward. Then they will bring all their kinsmen from all the nations. So we see there's going to still be nations on earth as an offering to Adonai on horses and in chariots and on litters, mules and camels to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says Adonai. Just as B'nai Israel bring their grain offering in a clean vessel to the house of Adonai. I will also take some of them as priests and for Levites, says Adonai. Again, those that have again, completely, you know, belong to the Lord. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, will endure before me, it is a declaration of Adonai, so your descendants and your name will endure, again, referring to Israel. And it will come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh will come to bow down before me, says Adonai. So here again, clear you know proclamation that the shabbat is not be done away with it's going to be observed in the millennium and also rosh kadesh um, announcing again the the new moon the new month as they leave they will look on the corpses of the people who rebelled against me for their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched and they will be a horror to all flesh isaiah 66 22 uh, we see nine eternal things, again, in this chapter of Isaiah 66, the new heavens, the new earth, the seed of Israel, the name of Israel, again, the seed of Israel, the name of Israel is going to go on forever as well. The new moons, the Sabbaths, again, Sabbaths quote, referring to the, the I believe, the, the Sabbaths involved with the feast as well. All flesh eternal hell and punishment and people being permitted to look on the carcasses of those who have transgressed reward and punishment this is from the jewish study bible it's not a messianic study bible it's a jewish study bible but i thought the commentary was good a final description of the fates awaiting those who accept who accept the lord and those who reject the lord the distinction between judeans and non-judeans is not mentioned here the worshipers of the Lord in verse 23 include all flesh, not just Israelites. And the men who rebelled against God in verse 24 include Israelites, as the preceding two chapters make clear. Thus, the book ends on a highly universal note. <clears throat> After worshiping, the righteous will pass by the valley of Gehenna, immediately south of the Temple Mount, and there they will see the burning corpses of those who rebelled against God. Many medieval rabbinic commentators take this verse as a reference to Gehenna or hell, where sinners suffer punishment forever. It is not clear, however, the Deutero Isaiah, it's a commentary, imagines the sinners as remaining cognizant or in any or in any sense alive. Rather, the eternal fire burns but does not consume their corpses as a sign to those who pass by. 
Nonetheless, the later Jewish belief of punishment after death in a location called Kehenna developed out of this verse and on the idea of life after death in the Bible. Again, we studied about that. It was, uh, again, there's a, the Jews believe that, yes, there is life after death, either in hell if you reject God or in, hev in heaven or um, paradise with him. And new moon, the Lord in Jewish practice, verse 23 is always printed again after verse 24, so that the book ends on a positive note. So here we see again the uh, Jewish insight into the end of days as well. You know, it, it agrees with the messianic viewpoint. And, you know, may they come to see the light of Messiah Yeshua. We need to constantly be praying that for Israel that, and again, God is moving in Israel. Uh, Jewish people are coming to faith in Messiah. And we need to continually pray for their eyes to be open as they're studying the Torah, as they're studying the prophets, that they will see that Yeshua is the Messiah of the Tanakh. This is uh, the Dispensation of the Kingdom or Millennium by Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Again, another uh, Messianic Jewish scholar um, again, I try to, you know, uh, these are people that I know of that I've studied their works. And uh, this is what he says. Again, dispensation is a period of time. It refers to a period of time. So the millennium, which is going to happen again in the seventh, the, the seventh millennium from the, the time of creation. Again, it's the, uh, <clears throat> I even have a Jewish book on the temple called the Messianic Temple. Where they said, yeah, this is a temple that's going to be er erected for, you know, Messiah, even though they don't know it's Yeshua yet. So here, <clears throat> Revelation 21 to 10, the seventh and last dispensation has two names. It is called the dispensation of the kingdom or the dispensation of the millennium, again, or time of the kingdom, time of the millennium. The first name emphasizes the Messiah's rule over this particular planet. The second name emphasizes how long this rule will last, 1,000 years, again, thus millennium. The dispensation covers the period of Revelation 21 to 10. Although it is only 10 verses long, it covers a span of time of 1,000 years. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a great chain. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, or Hasetan, and bound him for a thousand years. He also threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him so that he could not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years will co be completed. After these things, he must be released for a short while. Then I saw thrones and people sat upon them, those to whom authority to judge was given. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Yeshua and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image, nor had they received his mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. In other words, the, they were resurrected. Their spirit, again, was, re was united with their, resur their resurrected body. <clears throat> the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. <clears throat> again, the this, this rest of the dead, those who were going to face the final judgment, who rejected God's mercy, his grace, uh, and belief in him. This, uh, the first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous. How fortunate and holy is the one who has a share in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no authority. So again, these people who have died and have rejected Messiah, they are going to be resurrected in bodies and they're going to suffer again a second and eternal death. But they shall be Kohanim, again, referring to the righteous of God, and they shall reign with him for a thousand years, again, speaking of the millennium. When the thousand years has entered, Satan will be released from his prison and he will come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the Kedoshim and the beloved city. But fire fell from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are too. And they shall be tortured day and night 
forever and ever. So here we see after, again, Yeshua's rule and reigning for a thousand years, and yet there's going to be people that are going to, again, listen to the lies of the enemy and think that they are going to destroy God's holy city and his people. The chief person, the key person in this case will be the Messiah, because the Messiah himself will be dispensing direct new revelation, Revelation 2, uh, Isaiah 2, 2 to 4. Let me just grab my Bible and just read that, read that verse. Hallelujah. Isaiah 2, 2 to 4. That will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, so that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths for the law or Torah will go out from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will mediate for many peoples. And they will beat their swords into plowshares and their swords, spears into pruning knives. Nation will not lift up a sword against nation. Never again will they learn war. And then verse five, come house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of Adonai. There's actually a song. Uh, I think Ted Pierce has a, has a song with those, with those words that we've sung before. Man's responsibility, the responsibility for the seventh dispensation or the millennium will have two facets. The first facet will be the same as the sixth dispensation, responsibility to the new covenant or renewed covenant of Messiah. Obedience to the new covenant means to accept the gift of righteousness that God offers to all men through faith in Yeshua the Messiah. There will be a second facet, obedience to the king and the new laws he will issue during this period. In the dispensation of the kingdom, there will be something old and something new. The old is a responsibility to respond to the demands of the new covenant, which means to exercise faith in Yeshua the Messiah, his substitutionary death, burial, and resurrection, and the new responsibility to obedience to the king will then be uh, visible here on earth in obedience to the laws he will issue. Man's specific test. The test during this, this dispensation will be for each one born in the kingdom to personally accept the king and his personal Lord, not in place of the gospel, but with the gospel. To accept the gospel means that one believes that Yeshua died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. Added to this will be the aspect of owning the king as one's Lord. So again, there's going to be people who uh, have been born in during the millennial time that are still going to have to receive Yeshua as their savior because they still have to be redeemed. Man's failure, there will also be the facet of failure in the future dispensation. Men will fail to accept the Messiah. And at the end of the millennium, Satan will be able to deceive humanity once again. Mankind will come together for one last revolt against God's authority by attempting to invade Israel and invade the holy city himself. Again, it's like, to me, it's mind boggling that, that, that there's still going to be people who are going to believe the lies of Satan, again, the deceiver, and again, come against God. The judgment and this dispensation will be the destruction of all those invading armies by fire out of heaven. Now, again, uh, it's, this is referring to, again, he seems to believe this is referring to, again, that last effort of Satan to uh, take over, which would be the uh, end of that thousand-year period. Grace will also be displayed during this particular dispensation in three ma major ways. First, during the kingdom, there will be the fulfillment of all Tanakh prophecies. Every prophecy that has remained unfulfilled until this time will find its fulfillment during the Messianic kingdom. The second way grace will be displayed is that it will be a period of prosperity for all mankind so that every man will be able to sit under his own vine and under his fig. In other words, there's going to be no poor, nobody with lack. There's going to be every, you know, every need is met. 
A third way grace will be displayed is that there will be immortality for the saved. Believers in the kingdom will not die. Only unbelievers in the kingdom will die. So now why? Because we've already been born again and resurrected prior to the, the millennial kingdom. We're given our, again, our eternal bodies, again, similar to uh, Yeshua. Isaiah 65, 20, no longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days for the, for the youth will die at a hundred years. The one who misses the mark of a hundred must be a curse. So you see that the lifespan is going to be much longer. This is a seventh dispensation. In fact, uh, there's other scriptures that if they, you know, if they died, you know, earlier they were considered cursed this is a seventh dispensation when this dispensation ends history will move from the aspect from the time to the from the aspect of time to the aspect of eternity as it enters into the eternal state again eight is always a number for eternal or eternity so at the end of the seventh year millennium we will enter in again the eternal state that god had planned for us from the very beginning Revelation 21, going forward, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So again, um, it's actually, a, you know, a, I believe a renewed heaven, a renewed earth. It's going to be, you know, like he originally attended paradise. The whole world will be a paradise with him, uh, you know, with us living with him forever and ever, you know, in again, the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth. I also heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling of God is among men and he shall tabernacle among them. Again, Sukkot, Sukkot, Sukkot. They shall be his people and God himself shall be among them and be their God. He shall wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Nor shall there be mourning or crying or pain any longer for the former things have passed away. And on the one seated upon the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Then he said, write for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, to the thirst I will freely give from the springs of water of life. The one who overcomes shall inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But for the cowardly and faithless and detestable and murderers and sexually immoral and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their lot is in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then came one of the seven angels holding the seven bowls full of the seven final plagues. And he spoke with me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Then he carried me away in the Ruach to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God having the glory of God, her radiance like a most precious stone, like a jasper sparkling like crystal. She had a great high wall with 12 gates and above the gates, 12 angels. And on the gates were inscribed the 12 tribes of B'nai Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them the 12 names of the 12 emissaries of the Lamb. The angel speaking with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is the same as its width. And if you study the Ezekiel temple in chapters 40 to 48, it describes that same type of, again, square uh, city. He measured the city with the rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The material of the city's walls was jasper, while the city was pure gold, clear as glass. The foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious stone. 
The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third uh, Chalcedony, the fourth Emerald, the fifth Zardanex, the sixth Carnelian, the seventh Yellow Topaz, the eighth Burl, the ninth Topaz, the tenth Chrysophrase, and the eleventh Jacinth, the twelve Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates was from a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple in her, for its temple is Adonai, Elohe, Zavaot, and the Lamb. And the city has no need for the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God lights it up, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nation shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates shall never be shut by day, for there will be no night there. And they shall bring into its glory and uh, bring into it the glory and honor of the nations. And nothing unholy shall ever enter it, nor anyone doing what is detestable or false, but only those written in the book of life. Again, referring to Yom Kippur. Revelation 22. <clears throat> Then the angel showed me a river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the city street. On either side of the river was a tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree for, for healing for the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in the city, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. Night shall be no more and people will have no need for lamplight nor sunlight for Adonai will shine on them and they shall reign forever and ever, amen. And to end this, we just, I wanna, I, this is just a, something, you know, I found online that I thought was good. Uh, again, facts about the millennium. <clears throat> Let me just go to my notes here. And I'm going to read some of them. So I'm going to pull up the scriptures because we need that this is the last part. Um, I sent them to you in your notes. <clears throat> but we want to see what the word says. So we see that number one, there will be unbelieving survivors remaining on the earth. We see that in Zechariah 14. So let's go there. And we're going to read um, from up to verse 19. So let me just get there, which would be all the way to, I'm highlighting it so you can, you can uh, know where I'm at. Then all the survivors from all the nations that attacked Jerusalem will go from year to year to worship the king Adonai Zevaot and to celebrate Sukkot. Furthermore, if any of the nations on earth do not go up to Jerusalem to worship the king Adonai Zevaot, they will have no reign. If the Egyptians do not go up and celebrate, they will have no rain. Instead, there will be the plague that Adonai will afflict on the nations that do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. This will be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations if they do not go up to celebrate Sukkot. Number two, all the nations will come to worship Yeshua, Zephaniah <clears throat> 2 verse 11. Adonai will be fearsome against them. For all the gods of the earth, he will make waste to them. He will, oh wait, do I got the wrong? Let me see. Zephaniah 2.11, okay. Uh, let's see. I think they may have the wrong verse here. 2.11, Adonai will be fearsome against them. For all the gods of the earth, he will make waste away. To him, he, okay, to him will bow, each from its place, the islands of the nation. So here it's saying, it's referring to that the nations will, will bow before him. Isaiah 66, 23, we already read. Zechariah 14, 14, 16. Again, these are in your notes. So let's look at Micah 4, 1 to 4. But at the end of days, the mountain of Adonai's house will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the, above the hills. Peoples will flow up to it. Then many nations will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Adonai. 
the house of Jacob, the God of the house of the God of Jacob. Then he will direct us in his ways and we will walk in his paths for Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of Adonai from Jerusalem. So here we see in the millennium, the Torah is going to be taught by Messiah himself. He will judge between many peoples and decide for the mighty nations far off. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning shears. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, nor will they learn war again. But each man will sit under his vine and under his fig tree, and no one causing terror, for the mouth of Adonai Zavaot has spoken. Though all the people will walk each though, though all the peoples will walk each in the name of his God. So we ourselves will walk in the name of Adonai Eloheinu forever and ever. Uh, three, Yeshua will both will unite both houses of Israel in the land and physically rule over all nations. Again, from Jerusalem, we see that in Ezekiel 37, uh, which is a much talked about um, chapter in Ezekiel that really that that chapter brought you know has uh, brought many people to uh to the torah and realizing again who they are in messiah ezekiel 37 15 to 28 the word of adonai came to me saying you son of man take one stick and write in it for judah for b'nai israel joined with him then take another stick and write it for joseph the stick of ephraim and all the house of Israel joined with him. Join them one to another for yourself as one stick so that they will become in one hand. So verse 16 is referring to all of Israel, all 12 tribes and those joined with them. When the children of your people speak to you saying, won't you tell us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus says Adonai Elohim, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph which is in the hand of Ephraim, referring to the, the northern 10 tribes and the tribes of Israel joined with him. And I will put them together with the stick of Judah and make them one stick and they will be one in my hand. The sticks that you write on will be in your hand before their eyes. Then say to them, thus says Adonai Elohim, behold, I will take B'nai Israel from among the nations where they have gone. I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Again, we see that fulfilled with Judah being brought back into Israel. I will make them one nation in the land, and on the mountains of Israel, one king will be king all, to all of them, who was at Yeshua. Again, this is speaking of millennium. They will no longer be two nations and never again be divided <clears throat> into two kingdoms. They will never again be defiled with their idols or detestable things or any of their transgressions. I will save them out of their dwellings in which they sinned. I will purify them. Then they will be my people and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them. They will all have one shepherd. Again, I believe David is a, a, again, is a type of Messiah, but David will be, again, king in Israel as well. I don't know how that's all going to work out, but God has it all worked out. Um, they will walk in my ordinances and observe my rulings and do them. Why do I say that? Because some believe that it's David is going to be, rule, be ruling in physical Israel and Yeshua in uh, the new Jerusalem above. But as I, receive, I read other scriptures, it's clear that it's Yeshua who was ruling and reigning uh, from Jerusalem. But I know that King David will have, you know, a, a part in it as king as well. Um, they will never again be defiled with their idols or detestable things or with any of their transgressions. transgressions. I will save them out of all their dwellings in which they sin. I will purify them, then they will be my people and I will be their God. Again, my servant David would be king over them. They will all have one shepherd. They will walk in my ordinance, observe my rulings and do them. They will live in the land that I give to my servant Jacob where your ancestors live. They will live there, they, their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David will be their prince forever. I will cut a covenant of shalom with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. I will give to them and multiply them. I will set up my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be over them and I will be their God and they will be my people. 
then the nations will know that I am Adonai who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. Now we know Israel is in the process of preparing for the third temple, which I believe will be the, the you know, the, uh, I don't know if it'll be totally built. I know it'd be totally built in the millennium because technically all they need to do for to redo the sacrifices is the altar itself. And, and again, certain things like the red heifer and they already have the priesthood and uh, the Kohen. They have, they've been training, you know, for that day. And we know it'll come to pass. Why? Because God says so. Hallelujah. Uh, we also see Zechariah 2, uh, 10 to 12. Uh, Ezekiel 43, 5 to 7. Zechariah 8, 3. And Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. Regarding the reunification of all Israel. Um, I want to look at, uh, let's look at Isaiah you have all these scriptures, so you could, you know, I, I highly recommend you look at these scriptures and you highlight them in your Bible and you hide, you hide them in your heart as well. Let's see, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. <coughs> My throat's getting a little, <coughs> I forgot to bring water in here. 9, 6, and 7. Of the increase of his government and shalom, there will be no end. <coughs> on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish, let me highlight this, <coughs> it through justice and righteousness from now until forevermore, the seal of Adonai Zevaot will accomplish it. So again, it's Yahweh who's gonna accomplish these things. <coughs> then Isaiah 1, 11 to 16. <coughs> <coughs> Oh, Isaiah 11, 1 to 16. Let's see. 11 to 16. Okay. <clears throat> For, whoops. For what is it to me, the multitude of your sacrifices? Thank you. Says Adonai. I am full of burnt offerings of rams and fat, and fat of fed animals. I have no delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or he goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand, trampling my courts? Bring no more worthless offerings. Again, why did God consider them worth, worthless? Because they were sinning and bringing offerings without repentance and obedience. I just had to take some water there. <clears throat> Verse 13, bring no more worthless offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Shabbat, the calling of convocations. I cannot endure it. Iniquity with solemn assembly. Again, there's why. That's the answer because of the iniquity. Your new moons and your festivals my soul hates. They are a burden to me and I am weary to bear them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. When you multiply prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your days before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come, let us reason together, says Adonai. Though your sins be like scarlet, they will be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will become like wool. If you are willing and obey, you will eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured, devoured with the sword, for the mouth of Adonai has spoken it. <clears throat> so again, there's, you know, God requires of, you know, even what we do, it has to be done out of a pure heart, a repentive heart, not going out there and sinning and then thinking, you know, we can come to Shabbat and, you know, like nothing happened or give our offerings or whatever. You know, God is looking at the attitude of our heart. And praise God in the in the millennium time, you know, uh, again, there's going to be a purification over all the earth. <clears throat> uh, four will be mandatory for all mankind to keep the feast days. We see that in Isaiah 66, 23, what, what we read in Zechariah 14, 16. Five, the seventh day Sabbath will be observed by all. Again, we saw that in Isaiah 66. Uh, Yeshua will enforce the Leviticus dietary laws. Again, we see that in Isaiah 66. Seven, every idol will be demolished and every false religion abolished. 
there will be no uh, other religion except, you know, the 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 faith in Yahweh Zevaot and His Torah. It'll be the only faith throughout the earth. Hallelujah. Number eight, nations are denied rain if they fail to pilgrimage to Jerusalem during the Feast of Tabernacles. We saw that in Zechariah 14, 16, and 19. The curse uh, to na number nine, the curse to nature will be reversed and there will no longer be carnivorous animals in the kingdom. Let's go to Isaiah 11, six to nine. And this is the millennial kingdom. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the kid. The calf and young lion and the yearling together and a little child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze. Their young ones lie down together and the lion will eat straw like an ox. A nursing child will play by a cobra's hole and a wean child will put his hand into a viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy kingdom. <clears throat> For the earth will be full of the knowledge of Adonai as the waters cover the sea. Number 10, humans will live to be hundreds of years in age. Again, we see that in Isaiah 65, uh, 19 to 23. So let's go there. This is the end of this. Um, but I think it's really important. This is something that, again, you could share with uh, people because we have a wonderful future to look forward to. Isaiah 65, <clears throat> 19 to 23. Then I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No longer will the voice of weeping or the voice of crying be heard in her. No longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the youth will die at a hundred years, but one who misses the mark of a hundred must be accursed. <clears throat> they will build houses and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They will not build and another inhabit, nor plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree will be the days of my people, and my chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. They will not labor in vain, nor build children for calamity. For they are the offspring of those blessed by Adonai, as well as their descendants with them. <clears throat> 11, Yeshua will set up Levites to serve in the temple due to, uh, again, due to, it's, you know, he puts it due to his inability to serve as a high priest while on earth. But the fact is, he is a Kohen Hagadol in heaven, but the Levites can only come from the tribe of Levi, who will serve in the millennial temple. But there's also a scripture that we read that says that he will also choose those among the Gentiles uh, to serve as uh, priests in, in, uh, in his courts as well. Um, <clears throat> number 12, there will be no more weapons due to world peace. You saw that in Micah 4, 1 to 4. 13, the immortal saints rule over and judge the nations of the earth with Yeshua. We read that in Revelation 20. Uh, Daniel 22, let's look at Daniel uh, 7, 22, and 27, uh, I believe it's 27, let's see. Uh, let's see, we'll begin with verse 21. As I was watching, that horn was waging war against the Kedoshim and overpowering him. Again, this is referring to <clears throat> the anti-Messiah. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was rendered in favor of the Kedoshim of the Most High. When the time came and the Kedoshim uh, possessed the kingdom. Thus he explained the fourth beast will be a fourth kingdom on the earth that will be different from all other kingdoms. It will devour the whole earth and, and trample it and crush it again, referring to the, the Antichrist, the Anti-Messiah, his rule and reign. He will speak words against the Most High and will continually harass the Kedoshim of the Most High and will try to change the appointed times and law. The Kedoshim will be handed over to him for a time, times and half a time, which I believe is three and a half years. But the court will sit and he will be stripped of his power to be destroyed and abolished for all time. Then the kingdom, power and greatness of the kingdoms under all heaven will be given to the people of the Kedoshim of the Most High. Their kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion will serve and obey him. 
uh, 14, people will travel great distance to hear Yeshua teach the law or Torah, which we saw in Micah 4. 15, the saints are given glorified immortal bodies, much like Yeshua's own. We see that. Let's look at these scriptures. Uh, 1 John 3, 2. <clears throat> And this is uh, almost at the end. Loved ones, now we are uh, God's children, and it is yet not revealed what we will be. But we do know that when it's revealed, we shall be like him because we will see him just as he is. Everyone who has his hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So again, we are preparing ourselves Again, for his for his return, but every day living a purified life in him. Why? Because we have that hope in him and we are looking for his return. First Thessalonians 4, 17. Then we who are alive, let me get it in the verse 13. Now we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep. So you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Again, referred to being asleep as being in the presence of God. Again, we studied about that they, you know, our spirit goes to be with the presence of God while, you know, the body is to be resurrected later. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, so with him, God will also bring those who have fallen asleep in Yeshua. Again, resting. When you sleep, what are you doing? You're resting. We're resting in Messiah and his presence. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way precede those who are asleep or those who have already gone before. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the blast of God's shofar, and the dead in Messiah will rise first. And those who are alive, who are left behind, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall ever, forever, always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last shofar, and in the last shofar is referring to uh Rosh uh, Hashanah or Yam Teruah, the great shofar is referring to Yam Kippur. For the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruptibility and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible will have put on incorruptibility, this mortal will have put on immortality. Then shall come to pass the saying that is, death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is Torah. What, now, why is he saying that? Because Torah refers to sin, refers to what sin is, refers to what God's righteous standard is. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Therefore, my dearly beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And then the very last is 16. A millennial temple is constructed and animal uh, sacrifices are reinstated. And we see this in Ezekiel chapter 40 to 48. No, I'm not going to read it all. <laughs> but again, that is speaking of, again, the future temple. And again, a lot of scholars, uh, you know, even Messianic Jewish scholars say, well, you know, the word says that we don't know. And I believe the sacrifices are going to be for those who have not been redeemed yet, who haven't accepted Messiah again. I don't know. Many scholars don't know, but the word says there will be sacrifices uh, uh, reinstated when the temple is reinstated. And I believe it's for those who have been left on the earth after the tribulation. So again, that's what the word says. Hallelujah. So that is the end of this study. Again, I recommend uh, you keep it. It kind of helps answer the qu questions and people say, well, why don't you celebrate uh, Yesh you know, Jesus, which who they know him by Yeshua's birthday on December 25th. And you can give them, you know, uh, 
a good answer to, well, because that's not his birthday. <laughs> that's not that the scripture points that it was more than likely during Sukkot. And you have a greater understanding of Sukkot and our future. Again, Sukkot, resting in Messiah, ruling and reigning with him. Uh, again, he'll have assignments for every believer. You know, again, this the walk we have on earth will determine what we're going to be do for all eternity as far as, you know, our jobs and our rewards. So we want to be faithful to the end. We want to be faithful and not give up. We want to be faithful and keep our eyes on Yeshua and the word and not, you know, look down on what's happening on the earth, but look up because Matthew 24, Yeshua says, when you see all these things happening upon the earth, all this tribulation, rejoice and look up for your redemption draws nigh. Amen. Hallelujah.